Eric Salahab, welcome to the Anatomy and Clay Learning System podcast. Mark, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's good to be here. Great to have you on. We uh, connected because we did a previous interview with Lynn Ross out of Pueblo Community College about some of her anatomy instruction and training down there. And she had taken a class with you about hands-on learning. So this particular podcast chat won't be so much about anatomy, but it'll be very much something that anatomy and clay cares a lot about, and that is hands-on learning. So we wanted, wanted to find out more about the um, Hands-On Learning Institute and all your background and training um, and point of view about this very important subject. So Eric, if you could just start off and just tell us where you're based. I know you're with Front Range Community College. Are you at the Fort Collins campus or in Westminster? So um, my home office here is in Fort Collins at the Larimer campus. And so I did my Active Learning Institute. Um, so you called it the hands, hands-on hands learning. We call ours yeah, the Active the Learning active Institute. Learn, yeah. um, but it is right lined up with hands-on learning. And so yeah. we've, we've done that here at our college at um, Front Range Community College for seven years. This past year, we've scaled to the entire community college system in Colorado, and that's when I got a chance to work with Lynn um, as one of the Pueblo faculty. Ah, I was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's So when did that expansion come about? That's recent. Um, <laughs> last fall, fall okay. of uh, 22. So we okay. started uh, the Active Learning Institute here at our home college in 2017. And kind of based on the successes we've had and the demand, uh, we got a chance to scale it across the whole state this year. And we'll be doing that um, into next year as well. Fantastic. That's great. Well, let, let, well, let's, we'll get to that point. We'll get to about what all your work is about now. But let's set this up a little bit. Tell us about your own background. Were you trained as a quote unquote, traditional teacher. Um, how did you get into this whole area? So I'm a philosophy teacher. And as most, um, most college teachers would say, um, I had no training as a teacher other than my experience in the classroom. And uh, I think that is very typical, unless you're someone with a degree in education, uh, it is likely that you're in front of a classroom with no training at all in pedagogy or course design or andagogy or adult learning theory. Um, you're kind of just cut loose, as, as we all know, to, to go in and um, be a content expert, um, which you know kind of leads us to stand in front and lecture about the stuff that we are experts on. That is definitely the experience I had as a student, more or less, and what I did for the first 20 years as a teacher. And just out of curiosity, what was your particular area of emphasis in philosophy? Was there a certain... Um, part of philosophy that you were focused on? Uh, well, I liked philosophy in general. My specialty is ethics and applied ethics. So um, I studied environmental ethics. Uh, I studied animal rights, but just ethics in general is kind of my bread and butter, what I really enjoy teaching. And, and my job at a community college, I mo more or less teach 100 level philosophy courses, intro to philosophy, logic, ethics, and a few other things. Right. And what prompted the sort of shift or turn into what you're doing now? Well, um, so the origin story of the Active Learning Institute, and I'm going to speak for myself and for my partner, Carrie Mitchell. She's an English faculty here at Front Range Community College as well. Um, we created the Active Learning Institute um, as partners, and it all started, we had been teaching together. So she teaches English, I teach philosophy. We had taught in a learning communities program where you take two courses and kind of blend them together and try to offer uh, an integrated experience for students. And that was awesome. Um, we still, you know, we had the same group of students. So we'd sit in ethics um, and she would watch me lecture to students. And then we move over to her writing classroom and I would watch her teach writing to students. So we did that for several years, slowly attuning our classes to each other. Um, and then we decided to take our learning community and, and put it online as a completely asynchronous online class. And we had both been online teachers before, but that forced us for the first time ever to really start from scratch, to, to design a class from scratch. And because we had to negotiate everything, including the learning outcomes, the assessments, the assignments, the readings, we had to, maybe for the first time ever, actually justify why is this homework here? Why is this reading here? And, and that was really the genesis of um, the Active Learning Institute, which is really based on backwards design around outcomes. Uh, it's about getting the students to do the work. And so it was that 
class that we moved online for the first time, designed from scratch around outcomes to really put students at the, the front and center that started it. And what really drove us was seeing the success in student learning, um, the dramatic changes in how much students can learn, the level of work that they can produce, their enjoyment and motivation to do all in the class. And so it was that experience that kind of led us back to the research. I'll just say, um, you know, we kind of thought we invented active learning. Um, you know, this has been around mm -hmm. for a long mm -hmm. time. And that just may speak to how deeply entrenched most teachers are with this transmission of knowledge paradigm that we really can't even conceive of another way of doing things. And so that's really where we got started, Mark, 2015 or so, seeing our students produce work um, at a very high level and trying to figure out why, why is this happening? Yeah, I was about to ask if this was something pandemic related or pre pandemic. It was definitely long before that. It was pre pandemic. Um, and I don't want to say we had never had students learn at all. Of course, we had. <laughs> um, but, you know, just the dramatic difference that changes in a, the design of a course can make in um, the sor sort of learning outcomes students can achieve um, was dramatic. And we saw that in our own classes. I'll just say uh, it's not just an anecdote. I mean, this the research is out there. The same experience uh, is being had by teachers from across the disciplines, including, I know you work with Lynn. Um, I'll say most of the research we've seen uh, has come out of STEM fields, uh, science, mm -hmm. math, engineering, um, maybe because those fields have funding for research. They're also maybe more attuned to uh, common exams, and they can really report out um, uh, success metrics in a way that makes sense, but also because success in those classes, especially for women in STEM classes, um, first generation college students, and other underrepresented groups um, just aren't doing so well. Um, and so there's a lot of research out there beyond what we've seen in our classes. Yeah, some some topics, subjects are obviously hands on. Uh, learning to be a chef is going to be hands on auto mechanics hands on art if you're painting or drawing anything is going to be hands on how did we get to that point of where we were so focused on transmitting from the front of the the sage on the stage kind of approach um it goes back a long way mark um i've you know i i have some pictures um of lecture halls from 1350, you know, it's from the middle of the 14th century. And, wow. you know, it, it looks more or less exactly like a college classroom today. And, and kind of my, my aside, which is, you know, a little uh, snarky maybe is, you know, that made a lot of sense when there was one book. And when there literally <laughs> was one book, I mean, it was a handwritten book before the printing press. And this idea that there's a sage on the stage, the content expert who has the knowledge that you need, there was a time when that was true. And if you wanted the knowledge in the book, you really had to go to where the book was and probably sit in an audience trying to scribe down what the, you know, what the professor was reading out of the book or, or giving the lecture. And so it has been around for a long time. I mean, as a philosopher, I think you know, all the way back to ancient Greece, you know, even Aristotle had lecture notes. Um, of course, Socrates had no lecture notes because he didn't think he knew anything. And so he didn't think he had knowledge to dispense. But, you know, more or less, I think um, we've been in this paradigm for a long time. Now, as you mentioned, active learning has always been around. Um, if you want to be an artist, you're probably going to do some drawing and sculpting yourself. If you want to learn auto mechanics, which we do here at my college, you're going to be spending time in the auto shop. Um, the welders spend time in the welding lab, but I'll just say there's there are huge lecture components often sure. to those classes as well. And so when we work with automotive faculty and machining faculty and welding faculty, you know they know how to do active learning in the lab. What they want help with is the three hour long blocks of lectures where they're trying to teach metallurgy or uh, all the tremendous amount of content that goes along with those active skills as well. And so even those of us as teachers who know hands on learning, you know, doing the work is the way to go often still are mired in that lecture model. Uh, and I do want to say I am not suggesting that gaining currency with the content isn't vital for students. It absolutely is. I'm just more challenging the idea that students learn that best taking up that precious time they have with their teachers in class. Can you give us some examples? And I, I'm sure there are many different variety of examples, but as you 
work with, say, a, a welding class and they want to talk about how to transform their lecture components or even philosophy doesn't sound like it lends itself to hands-on learning, at least to me, other than a group discussion, perhaps. But give me a few anecdotes or examples of the kinds of transformations you've tried to um, encourage. Um, well, I'll um, here's a, a paraphrase from one of the my my one of my colleagues who went through the Active Learning Institute. As she was thinking about this, she's really thinking it's often easier to just you know I'm the content expert. I can explain things to students. But every time you're about to tell someone something, she just suggested really think about, am I stealing my, my students' chance to actually learn? And so what we know from learning is it is a physical process that's happening in the brain. I mean, it is literally a physical process of neurons growing and getting stronger and connecting up into, um, you know, neural networks and, um, you know, creating memories, encoding them, and then figuring out how to recall memories. And so... Um, you know, I'm just going back to what you said earlier. Yeah. It's not just hands on, but I think that's a great way to think about um, a quote from maybe one of my active learning mentors, Dr. Terry Doyle. He wrote a great book called Learner Centered Teaching. And I often just say, if you're going to memorize one thing about active learning is this the person who does the work does the learning. And so it's really all about, in general, how can I think about getting the student to do the work? And so there's a reason we're great at what we do. We lecture constantly. We generate examples. We generate more examples and anecdotes and stories and great stories. And, and so it's, it's, in general, how do we get students to do that? Um, so, I mean, I can give you, you know, like in philosophy, um, if you want students, for instance, to analyze concepts and make connections, um, lecturing on those connections is probably not the way to go. I mean, you really want students to be forced to probably get into a group, um, to actually work, to write, to talk. Uh, and so the hands-on, it could be kinesthetic, but it's not necessarily kinesthetic. It's really just about, <laughs> excuse me, how do we get students you know, to do the work. And so an example, why do I need to do the lecture if I can get students to actually do the reading outside of class and then ask them to come to class and generate the things that needed to be on the board themselves? And so I've got lots of examples of how that works, for instance, in a nursing class. Nursing classes are notorious to, you know, full of long lectures because there's just thousands and thousands of bits of content. Um, we've seen examples of where teachers will actually just encourage the students to either read out of the textbook or they're going to actually watch the lectures that have been video recorded. Again, they need to get the content, but then actually give them a reason to come to class, to talk about it, to put it on the board. And so I'll just say there's very, very little that the teacher does in class often that the student couldn't do, except for the fact that we're, we're both of us, students or teachers, are kind of trapped in this codependent relationship where <laughs> teacher's identity is often based on the fact that it's my classroom and I gain my identity and my respect for myself from the fact that I'm, I'm good in front of the class and, and students clearly buy into that too. And so, um, you know, we just need to break out of that mold and I'm going to say active learning, at least the way you know, my partner, Carrie Mitchell, and I talk about it. It's not a set of tips and tricks. There's there's no, I mean, there's a bunch of tips and tricks. There's hundreds of books out there with active learning activities. Um, you know, think pair shares and Freer models and I mean, you name it. But it's really more about thinking, what's the skill that I need my student to actually showcase? How can I give them relevant practice with that skill? And so, recalling is a skill. And so if it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with memorization. If you're in anatomy and physiology, you're probably going to need to memorize hundreds, if not thousands of, of things and, and really know them well. Um, it's recall as a practice. And so um, I don't know if that, maybe those weren't specific examples, Mark, but the idea is it's going to be different, right? Because depending on what the skill is you want students to learn uh, and be, become proficient at, how do I really help students practice that skill instead of showing them the skill, um, which is yeah. fine too. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, no lectures or no examples, but it's really about changing the dynamic of what's happening in the classroom. Yeah, oh, I plead guilty to uh, making active learning and hands-on somewhat synonymous. And I, uh, I appreciate that 
active learning is the broader category. Hands-on is a subset of that. And I appreciate your description of, I can picture a much more active classroom with students engaged um, when they're set up like that. Of course, I think we all sort of picture a college classroom. And like you say, you picture the, the lecture hall and the you know seats rising up dozens of rows and somebody in the front and in, in the movie, in the movie clips, there's always a student sound asleep, um, you know, just absolutely, <laughs> yeah. you know, Mark, yeah. it's funny um, it, uh, when we're um, I'll, I'll share a picture with you later. But um, in this image that I have from 1350, there's a student asleep. Even yeah. back then, he's sleeping through the lecture. So, yeah, not much has changed in 700 years. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. What was the. Um, I mean, not pushback, or what, what was the institution's reaction to you coming forward with this approach? And talk a little bit about how that evolved from 2015 to where things sure. are today. Well, Carrie and I had this epiphany in our class where we actually saw students. Now, we had both been teachers for 20 years. I think we were good teachers. And so students were already successful in our classes. When we saw students really jump, I want to say, overall an entire letter grade, which is what we really see from the research that the difference an active learning approach can make. It's not just a kind of whimsical 10% more learning. It really cashes out into about 10% more on a 0 to 100 scale, which, you know, I'm not a statistician, but that is vastly significant when we're talking sure. about something like grades. So when we saw that happen to our students, and it was great. I mean, we care about student learning, but I also want to say as a teacher, it is so fulfilling to see students rising above the level maybe that you expected that they would do. And, and you know, grading sometimes is a chore, but when your students are excelling and trying and super motivated, um, it just makes teaching a joy. And so, you know, we were selfish. We we loved what we were doing. But we wanted other teachers to get that experience for themselves. Uh, we maybe wanted to hear less grumbling in the hallways around, you know, grading time when we were, you know, kind of sitting there grading, smiling and laughing and having fun. Not always. Right. And so we decided to do some research and we wrote a a uh, small grant that was funded internally by my school uh, to run a pilot active learning institute. Um, we handpicked some colleagues who we thought would kind of go along with us, be risk takers, but also offer us good constructive uh, criticism and feedback. And so we started with a, a pilot active learning institute, and we really grew from there semester by semester based on the grassroots demands of, of our colleagues who, who were longing and looking for uh, meaningful professional development. I think our leaders were interested in it, especially when we started citing actual peer-reviewed research that showed the potential to improve student learning across the board for all students. And maybe I'm equally or more exciting over the last five to 10 years, there's a lot of research that an active learning intervention um, can close or eliminate these equity success gaps. And so that is a big deal for colleges across the country. It is a big deal for, for my school. When we look at our disaggregated success data, Overall, we're very successful. Um, but like most other schools across the country, we're seeing these equity gaps, um, underrepresented minoritized student groups, first generation college students, um, women in STEM fields are kind of suffering under a five or more percent, what I'm going to call opportunity gap. Um, and I'm intentionally not using the phrase success gap, which I think at least uh, suggests that it's something about the student that's leading to this gap. When you see research showing that changes in course design can eliminate a gap in one semester, it really causes me to look inward, right? It, it's something that that I'm doing in my classroom um, as opposed to some intractable problem with certain students that there's nothing I can do about. And so when our leaders started seeing, number one, faculty and instructors really interested in, in doing professional development and the potential um, you know, to, to have more success in, in across the board and with, with these, um, you know, in these equity areas, that was a big deal to continue to get funding. Wow. So you're saying you're already seeing strong data that suggest these opportunity gaps are being closed. Absolutely. Um, I have a, you know, a, a lit review um, 
a big study came out in 2020 that was a meta-analysis meta of a bunch of studies. Again, many of these studies are done in STEM fields, uh, so science and math, uh, engineering. Um, and again, we're seeing um, it, it's not always an elimination of the gap, but often these uh, equity gaps in terms of pass rates are completely eliminated or closing by 50% or it, it depends on which study, but absolutely, we're seeing that here as well. So even with our own internally generated data, uh, our biology program uh, here um, it has some of the classes have completely eliminated those gaps. And when we're talking about classes that feed nursing programs, I mean, those gaps are a big problem everywhere, but when we're looking at, you know, courses that might have a low pass rate overall, uh, an atom in physiology might have a 60% pass rate or a 55% pass rate, an active learning intervention can raise that pass rate to 85% and eliminate the opportunity gaps, um, a really big deal, uh, for, you know, for those gatekeeper courses, especially. Wow, wow. That is really uh, sterling. Uh, those are sterling numbers. You know, it's hard to argue uh, with the numbers. Now, I will say it's one thing to see these numbers cashed out and research done, you know, nationally. I teach at a community college, so I think we always ask, will we see those numbers here? And so I think the promise, or at least the potential is out there. And I think that's what kind of has, you know, driven us to, to keep working on active learning. We really want to see, you know, the, 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 those things happening here. We need to do more assessment. But I will mention, Mark, I just came back from a, a national conference. Uh, this was a school in Alabama doing something. They don't call theirs the Active Learning Institute, but it's it's developed along the same general principles, and they were seeing actual numbers at their schools that mirror those those research numbers. They were not only seeing um, closing of gaps and pass rate changes in given courses, but they were seeing that cash out just in a few years with graduation rates. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'll just say as a community college teacher, this is my 25th year, or I think we, what we've realized more recently is we may be doing our students a disservice if we mainly focus on getting them in the door and we don't spend as much time thinking about how do we help them succeed and graduate. And so when we see research that not only says we can help students make it past these gatekeeper courses, the connection between that and graduating uh, is a really big deal. Um, so yes, we want to do both. We want to be here for every student, but we also want to make sure we're not just bringing them in, we're actually helping them succeed. That's great. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Can you talk about, I mean, you hear a lot about today's learners, the, the student sort of attitude in the post uh, mobile device world, <laughs> internet world. This seems to make a lot of sense about just thinking about uh, engagement in terms of just how much information is available uh, to any student at any one time to go get it. So creating these kinds of opportunities in a class that are so different than the other ways of going out onto the internet and accessing a little piece of data or information, it seems to make a lot, this just seems practical to me. Agreed. And I'll just say, if you know, if your students want to watch lectures of philosophy, there's a yeah. million great, <laughs> and I'm not even joking. I mean, there are yeah. a lot of really, really high quality, 100 level philosophy videos already out there. So part of the question is, why would I, I don't say waste time, use my precious time with students doing something that they could easily access on their own? Um, I think you're also asking maybe, um, are students different these days? And does active yeah. learning, you know, I, th I don't think our brains are different. And this is something teachers talk about all the time. I don't, I don't think students are really much different. I think their differences are, are you know, kind of superficial around, around the outside. I'll say, um, I think active learning helps uh, students focus. I mean, we know multitasking, this is something, you know, based on the research, human beings are horrible at multitasking. Now we can switch task during a lecture, it's very likely that students are not paying attention. And so there's been some research by actually by Benjamin Bloom of Bloom's taxonomy fame. He did some research on what's actually happening during a lecture. And it's a paraphrase, but I think it's something like, you know, less than 2% of the time are students actually doing critical thinking related to what's going on in front of the classroom. And so most of the time they're doing something else. And you know, if you've been in a college classroom, well, they probably have a laptop open and they're probably doing something completely different. And so, 
you know, something else, something active, something to engage students in the moment, I think is, is very effective uh, for them. Um, I'll just say, though, I don't think students are different. I think Active learning actually tries to engage students' intrinsic motivation to learn, and human beings are learning creatures by nature, and so if we can actually tap into that desire to learn, all those other things that might get in the way kind of fall away, because once someone has that motivation, once they experience that learning, um, then I think a lot of those things that maybe teachers complain about aren't as big a deal uh, as they are. I'll also say with all those devices, cheating is really easy. Um, and so active learning that really speaks to authentic learning and students showcasing their learning and some autonomy um, can also give students reasons to not cheat, right? I mean, because if they actually decide they want to learn something, then they'll just automatically recognize that having an AI write your papers um, may not be the best strategy for learning. It may be a great strategy for getting a grade, uh, probably not a great strategy for learning. Probably not. Probably not. Wow. So you're still teaching. I'm still teaching. I'm on a hiatus from teaching um, this year just because I'm working full time uh, running active learning institutes uh, across the state of Colorado. Um, and we're doing, I'll just say, we're doing all those by Zoom because we have, you know, 13 community colleges in Colorado. And I looked at a map. I mean, if you, you know, they're 300 miles apart. And so we're, we're, we're bringing in faculty and instructors from across the whole state working together in mixed discipline cohorts uh, all by Zoom uh, right now. And what's the re reaction across the statewide system? Um, well, we have had, um, I'll, I'm just going to say, really great reactions. Um, so we finished our second set of cohorts just a few weeks ago. Um, we ended up training, um, I won't say training, we, we provided a workshop experience for close to 100 faculty and instructors across the state. So they each, they each did a 30-hour workshop series during the semester. Uh, and then they do a course redesign. And that's a critical component of the Active Learning Institute. It's not just, a, it's not a content dump anyway. I mean, it's there's, there's a few lectures, but it's really an en engaged series of workshops. And then teachers are expected and paid to redesign a class around what they've learned. Then they implement that new class and they assess the difference. And so I'll just say, um, based on the number of applicants we have, we're getting more than twice as many applicants as we have seats for consistently. Um, and, you know, that's horrible when I have to, I was working on this morning, trying to decide who gets in and, and who has to wait. Um, but on the bright side, that really says it's, uh, there's a high demand for faculty. They really want their students to learn more. Um, I'll just say the Active Learning Institute is, uh, it's a very challenging experience for teachers. It is challenging often our very identity as teachers. And often it's forcing a realization that what I've devoted my life to, becoming a content expert, isn't really helping students learn. And um, there are tears, <laughs> there are, uh, there's lots of angst. And so the, the fact that teachers want to do this, they want to put themselves out there, they're willing to, to, to challenge who they are, to change what they're doing, um, with the promise that students will learn more, uh, is just extremely gratifying to me uh, as a teacher. And so um, we're getting good reviews, um, but really it, it's, I'll, I will say it's about the design of the Active Learning Institute, but you know, the, the person who does the work does the learning, it's the teachers themselves that come. And they do the work and they come in and they talk and they work together and they redesign courses. Um, so to me, it's really successful because we have great teachers who, who you know, who want their students to learn and are, are willing to, to try something different, even if it's really scary, which it can yeah. be. So as you ran these Zoom workshops around the state, is there a way to model active learning in that process? That must Absolutely. Be uh, okay. We walk the walk. I mean, so okay. our we give pre-work and we don't call it homework. We call it pre-work. It's the work you do outside of class to set the whole cohort up to make the best use of our two hours of Zoom. And so we have pre-work um, and they're typically they're getting the content, they're doing the reading, they're watching videos, they're working in discussions ahead of time. Uh, as the facilitators, Carrie and I are looking at that pre-work, we're tweaking our agenda. And so it's often um, breakout rooms, reporting out, working on activities. And so we definitely try to model active learning 
in the Active Learning Institute in general, but also model specific active learning strategies that work in the context that we're working in, but that teachers might, you know, might take away and use. Um, and so absolutely, it's it's modeled around active learning. Um, that's, you know, par, uh, par for the course for us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, and I'll just say would... active learning works in any discipline, uh, in any modality. And so most of our teachers are not teaching by Zoom anymore. Um, you know, COVID's over. There's a few right. Zoom classes still out there. But we run by Zoom because it's the best way to accommodate all the people who want to participate. But our teachers are typically designing and redesigning courses for in-person modalities, uh, also for online asynchronous modalities. Um, and so, you know, uh, Active learning works in any modality, including you mentioned earlier the big lecture hall, uh, and that, you know that often may be the hardest nut to crack for teachers. And luckily, in community colleges, we don't have a lot of those big yeah. lecture halls. Um, but active learning will work anywhere because it's really more a way of thinking about the role and responsibilities of the student and teacher, as opposed to something that's locked into a particular you know, logistical setup. That's great. Wow. Well, as we kind of wrap up here, I know there's lots we could talk about, but you must look back on your own journey and just thinking about the last eight years in particular, just about how far this has come. You, I, I would assume, feel a great deal of pride about having seen this seed between you and Carrie kind of blossom into this statewide initiative. Wow. I mean, I'm pretty proud of it for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I have been a teacher for a long time and I definitely miss the direct access to my own students. Um, but I will say it is uh, very gratifying to help other teachers become better teachers because they want to. And then realizing maybe we were playing some part in the impact that they're having on their students. And so as you know, I'm not done with my career yet, but as I, I think about a legacy for myself, um, I'll just say it's not a secret. Carrie and I, like we wanna run the Active Learning Institute, but kind of our, our, our upfront um, secret is we want to change the paradigm. I mean, we want to leave behind this transmission of knowledge paradigm. Uh, it's maybe served us okay. I mean, most of us went through it, but we think, um, you know, paradigm shift is hard. Um, and we've been in the current paradigm for 700 years. It, it will be uh, a generational shift. And if we can have something to do with that, Mark, and I know you are, you're part of this paradigm shift too. Um, I think, you know, there's really nothing more important I could do than, you know, having uh, the potential to make a positive change in education in Colorado. Yep. Is K-12 next then? Well, in some ways, K-12 is ahead of us. It's fascinating yeah. to talk to our yeah. K-12 partners. And they'll often say, when students become seniors, we tell them college won't be like this. You need to get used to sitting and listening to lectures. Yeah. And so I'm not saying it's always the case, right. but um, often I feel like teachers are trying to prepare students for the, the teaching they're going to get at the next institution. And so I hear many of my colleagues say that. Well, I know lectures aren't great, but that's what they're going to get at CSU or CU. So I need to prepare them for it. I mean, at some point, we got to break the cycle. Yeah. Um, I think there's room for improvement all around, Mark, uh, yeah, K-12 yeah, yeah. and all the way up. Um, maybe kindergarten still does it right. There, there are few lectures in kindergarten, <laughs> uh, but everywhere else, it's a, there's a lot. <laughs> that's great. Eric Salahub, thank you so much for your time today. Wish you well, and uh, maybe we'll catch up down the road. I hope you do. Thank you so much for inviting me again. It's always fun to talk about active learning and um, it was fun. <laughs>